So as people join us now, I'm going to start um, sharing the um, slideshow. So good morning, um, everyone. Um, we should be going live uh, in a short while. I'm just waiting for a few more people to um, join. I'll just do a quick check on the um yeah okay I think everything's ready and all the satellites are lined up um it's just gone Hi, morning Niti I know you're possibly muted um actually quite interesting because I am seeing myself on the live stream, but I am not seeing you guys. That's kind of curious. Interesting. Um, let me just unmute you. For, just, just say something for a second, Moss. I want to just see if that kind of comes through. Hello. You can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I hear you absolutely fine. I just, um, I just, I can, I can see um, my screen of myself, but I just don't see um, you. Interesting. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to, um, I'm actually going to start um, the presentation. And um, yeah, interesting. I'm just going to see if there's anyone else going to join us online. All right. Yeah, it's okay. I think it does kick in because I can see um, Niti on occasions. So what I'll do is I will um, do a quick introduction now interesting right so um welcome to the um live streaming from um zimmer and peacock um, i'm going to do we're going to do this presentation in two parts um the first part i'm going to do most of the talking in the second part niti and mott um um and that's and, and mott is going to do um his presentation, he's going to do his presentation. So part one is going to be introduction to electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. I'm actually going to teach it through the mode of um, modeling and fitting. And the second part of the um, presentation will actually be practicals, um, where um, Mott and Niti um, will be doing it, um, doing their practicals. And we're going to do the conductivity of skin and the measurement of um, soil. So just as a quick way of background, um, my name is Martin Peacock. Um, I'm a chemist and a, um, an electrochemist by training. I'm one of the founders at Zimmer and Peacock. And it's worth saying, um, and I'm also a, um, um, an academic at Swansea University. So we have a kind of nice foot in both camps. We both like to do industrial sensors, and we also have a fair understanding of the demands of um, academic research as well. So today we're going to do an introduction to um, impedance spectroscopy, and we're going to do it um, from the perspective um, of biosensing. I'm just writing to my colleague in like, uh, um, as I go as well. So um, 
I just want to say, you know, I have some definitions here of impedance spectroscopy, and I always, I think there's a, for me, there's a real problem with impedance spectroscopy, um, and that's really, it's quite, it's quite confusing the way it's taught often or the way it's presented. So, for me, you know, one of the definitions of a, you know, is of elect of impedance spectroscopy is a method by which chemists can confuse non-electrochemists, or rather, electrochemists can confuse non-electrochemists. It's fair to say I think this is quite a confusing subject the way it's often presented. It's a good method by which electrochemists can um, be published in electrochemical journals, and I am an electrochemist, so I can say this statement, and then they can be read by other electrochemists. Um, it's also a way of measuring the properties of solutions. So um, impedance spectroscopy has a sub, um, there's a sub kind of class of it, which is conductivity measurements. Um, And I can see there's a lot of people joining us now and just online as well. Um, and it's a way of measuring conductivity. So you can use it to measure the conductivity of seawater. Um, I salinity, you can measure the conductivity of skin. Um, you can use it, use it to measure the conductivity of soil. And um, it's also a way of measuring the surfaces of biosensors, be it um, antigen detection or bacteria detection or virus detection. Now, electrochemical biosensors are super useful, actually, because they're a really good way of translating biology into information. So we can have something like um, a COVID-19 viral particle, and through something like a screen-printed electrode, you can convert that into a biosensor. Biosensing is really good because it plugs really well into um, electronics. And... Um, And um, then the um, um, and then you can um, turn that into information. I'm sorry that I've just got a colleague who's contacting me in real time as well, and I'm just trying to um, help him out as well a little bit. But I think uh, I possibly can't. So let me just do that very quickly. Um, now, what I'm going to do now is on my next um, slide. Um, I've used this slide in the past when talking about um, electrochemistry, and um, it's worth saying that, you know, in electrochemistry we have voltammetry, we have amperometry, we have potentiometry, and we have electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Today we're going to just focus on electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, but um, voltammetry and amperometry and potentiometry are also very useful, um, but today's talk is... I. It's often one of the not well understood um, topics, which is actually impedance spectroscopy. And that's why we're going to do a special one focused just on impedance spectroscopy. If you look back through some of our webinars, um, you'll see that we've actually done, um, we have covered voltammetry and amperometry and potentiometry. And it's probably worth saying, um, we even did some live demos when we were doing those. Now the equipment, it's, it's probably definitely worth noting that um, the kind of equipment or doing these kind of experiments is really quite small. It is slightly larger than this, but this potentiostat um, is a fair reflection of the kind of size of instrument that actually can be used for this. And when we talk about biosensors, um, I'll just grab a biosensor now out of one of the boxes. So the biosensors themselves can be um, quite small. So that's the nice thing about um, impedance spectroscopy. Once upon a time, the equipment used to be quite large and quite bulky and quite hard to set up. These days, uh, it can be quite small and compact and neat. Now, why is, electric, why is impedance spectroscopy so confusing? Um, and maybe for some people it's not so confusing, but I think it's confusing because it's actually often taught from a perspective of people who are interested in batteries or they're interested in capacitors or they're interested in corrosion and coatings. And so that really is, um, um, from that perspective, you know, they're, they're often using language about, you know, uh, that, that's related to what they're interested in, but they're not talking from the language of biosensing. So I think that electrochemical impedance spectroscopy is confusing because it's often taught by people who are actually interested in other subjects other than um, biosensing. And also I think that it's often approached from a very, um, mathematical perspective that people are 
um, interest, you know, they, they like to talk about um, vectors, they like to talk about reactants and resistance, they like to talk about resistance and capacitors. And these things are important. And they like to talk about how a capacitor's resistance changes with frequency, whereas a resistor's um, resistance doesn't change um, with frequency. They do like to talk about these things and they like to show you all the maths. The problem with that is that the maths can be quite confusing and quite um, decoupled from, from the practical in some way. So I like to approach it from a different perspective, which is let's just do some experiments and work it and work back towards understanding the theory sometimes. So um, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy is, really, is very relevant. Um, at the moment, for example, our sister company, Elixir, actually has a um, COVID-19 sensor. And though they are not specifically using impedance spectroscopy with that, um, it does give them the ability. Um, you could, you, they could have been interrogating that biosensor with impedance spectroscopy. Because in the end, electrochemistry is, is, is often a, a surface phenomena. You have an electrode, you change the surface, and the surface changes in proportional to an analyte. And you can um, you can interrogate that surface um, using impedance spectroscopy. We've talked about this in many of our other webinars. So, but you know, I want to keep bringing back these recurring themes that if you want to make a biosensor and you think impedance spectroscopy can be useful to you, then it's basically take a gold surface, maybe form a SAM layer on it. Um, anchor your antibodies to that, and then you can use impedance spectroscopy also as a way of looking at the interaction between um, antigens and antibodies or viral particles and receptors. Now, I just want to contrast absorption spectroscopy versus EIS, or electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. And the reason I want to contrast it is this. Um, people use absorption spectroscopy all of the time, and they don't worry about the underlying science. They, they believe they, under, they, understand, they understand the underlying science, and the underlying science is um, I have some molecules in the liquid phase. I shine light through, those, um, through the liquid phase, and the molecules absorb the light. And, and people understand that, and they're quite happy to accept it. Now, here I'm showing you that you know, they, they actually scan the wavelength. You could consider that actually scanning the frequency. So they start off at one frequency, high frequencies, and they go to low frequencies. Now, let's contrast that then with electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. We're not trying to pass a light through the sample, but we are trying to pass electricity through the sample. So if you could understand the concept of trying to pass light through a sample, i.e. absorption spectro spectroscopy, you could then understand that um, Electrochemical impedance spectroscopy is very similar, except rather than trying to pass light through, we're trying to pass electricity. And then they share another common theme, which is with absorption spectroscopy, you vary the wavelength and or frequency of the light. Um, and in impedance spectroscopy, we vary the wavelength. So if you're ever reading this kind of literature, you'll see something that's called, often it's called the Nyquist plot. And the Nyquist plot has this kind of semicircle and then it has this tail on it. And you get that kind of pattern because of what's happening on the surface. But what we, what we don't tell people is actually at one end of the Nyquist plot is high frequency and at the other end of the Nyquist plot is low frequency. So it really does have a, an, an analogy with absorption spectroscopy. In absorption spectroscopy, you vary the frequency of light and in um, in Peter spectroscopy, you vary the frequency of the electricity that you're trying to pass. So I do throw in the term Nyquist plot again, because it, this will keep coming back. Um, if you're interested in Peter spectroscopy and you're reading about this, people like to display their data, often in two types of plots, the Nyquist plot and the Bode plot. I'm not going to talk about the Bode plot today. And the reason being is, I've already spoken for 14 minutes, you know, where we're kind of hardly into this subject. So I just want to focus on one way of representing the data. You probably find that Mots and Niti might actually display their data in, in the Bode plot as well. But in the Nyquist plot, what are you looking at is this. Um, they don't, you have what they call the real impedance and the imaginary impedance. 
And the real impedance tells us about resistances at our, our electrode, and the imaginary imped impedance tells us about capacitance at our, our electrode. But really, what, what the Nyquist plot is, it's a series of experiments, each done at, at total high frequency going down to low frequency. And so it's a series of, um, really, you've got two parameters, what they call the real and the imaginary, and you plot them along the Nyquist plot. And what they're really doing is they're changing the frequency from very high to very low. And then you can represent your data or view your data either as, the, as they say, the Nyquist plot or the um, Bode plot. Now, what's happening is we actually have, you know, we take one of our, and I'll just grab one as an example. We take one of these screen printed electrodes and we functionalize it um, to make it specific to a piece of biology. So in this example, the anode has been functionalized to be receptive to this um, virus. Now, what's happened is whenever you take a metal and you coat it, you actually give it a, um, a capacitive or a capacitant nature. So in fact, we, we use the symbol capacitor because actually it does act a bit like a capacitor. Um, and then we also have what we call the charge transfer resistance. The resistance of electricity being passed between the interface and the electrode. So there's a, um, it has a capacitive nature and a resistive nature. And then there's another resistor in this circuit, which is the resistor between the other electrode that's in our circuit. So I've, you can look at this in two ways. I've drawn it as a piece of biology or chemistry, but also this biology and chemistry has electrical properties. Um, it has some capacitance properties, some resistance properties, and then the solution itself acts as a resistor. And so people, what people say is, Let's use what they call an equivalent circuit. So they pretend that all this biology and chemistry is actually acting like a circuit. And that allows them to then study the charge transfer resistance and the double layer capacitance. And in the, in the uh, example of conductance, um, or conductivity rather, they also can look at the solution resistance. So I'm going to break down the Nyquist plot a little bit. So in the Nyquist plot, What's happening is we're applying a voltage of plus or minus five millivolts, quite small. We're applying a small voltage and there's a small current response. Now, the Nyquist plot, I said, sort of, you know, sometimes has this kind of semicircle shape with a tail at the end of it. And what's happening is at high frequency, the capacitor easily allows the electricity to flow, i.e. its impedance is very low. So when we use high, when we start this experiment at high frequency, the current goes through the through the resistor. By the way, we this circuit, we call it the Randall cell. So if you hear people referring to the Randall cell, this is what they're referring to, that biosensors have often been modeled using something called the Randall cell. So I just want to kind of emphasize that a little bit. So the electricity um, passes through the resistor, passes through the capacitor. So at high frequency, we get, we mostly see the effect of this solution resistance. Now at the ever extreme, at very low frequencies, in fact, at low frequencies, capacitors or the double layer of this electrode has a very high impedance. And so the electricity actually flows through a different path. It goes through the solution resistance. Now it goes through this part of the circuit, which, um, and then out through here. So now we're actually seeing the effect of the, it's called the charge transfer resistance. The charge transfer resistance is the resistance of passing electrons from the solution into the electrode. So we have a charge transfer resistance. Now at very low frequencies, we actually start seeing the effect of things diffusing to the electrode. And they call this the, um, the Warburg element or the Warburg element. And so when you look at a Nyquist plot, think of it as a spectrum and understand that there's a whole series of experiments behind that spectrum at different frequencies. And if, if you're at very high frequency, you're seeing 
the um, the resistance due to the solution. At very low frequencies, you're starting to see the charge transfer resistance and the resistance due to diffusion. And then in these intermediate frequencies, the electricity can actually go two paths, one through the charge transfer resistor and one through the double layer capacitor. And that's why you start getting the semicircle because which route you take changes with, with as the frequency changes. And so we have this overall effect of getting this semicircle. If we didn't have the diffusion, we would actually just get a sort of complete semicircle. Now, people don't often talk, teach um, impedance spectroscopy like that. They like to, as I say, they like to teach you all this math and they like to show you that a capacitor has um, very low impedance at high frequency and very high impedance at low frequency. But I think it's actually easier to kind of um, show you by doing what we call simulation and um, fitting, and I'll be doing that pretty soon. I just want to say it is relevant, and this is this is actually um, a practical example of why it's relevant. So here we've taken a gold electrode, we've turned it into a biosensor by um, attaching a single strand of DNA, and then when the um, corresponding DNA or RNA um, or DNA binds to that single strand, rather, it basically starts blocking the surface. So what we have here is a series of Nyquist plots, one of them at um, low concentration of the binding DNA and one of them at high concentration of the binding DNA. And effectively, as the DNA um, increases, um, and the amount of binding increases, the circumference of this semicircle increases. And um, so effectively what's happening is the double layer capacitor is increasing and the charge transfer is, is increasing. Now this does make sense because effectively you've got a surface which is partly blocked by the single strand capture probe. And as more and more DNA um, binds to it, the surface is kind of blocked. And in fact, at that point, the resistance and capacitance um, is actually going up. And so, you know, this is not just a nice theory in practical terms. It, it does actually um, happen as well. And this is an example of, of that. I want to just make sure I, I really reference um, this piece of spectrum. Now, when, this, when, I, when we um, post this video later on in YouTube, I'll make sure that we definitely um, link um, so you can actually download this software. It's called EIS Spectrum um, Analyzer. Comes from um, some academics, I believe, in Belarus, and it's a really good teaching tool so for teaching yourself in penis spectroscopy. I think it's a, a really good um, teaching tool. Um, so what we'll be doing in a minute is we'll be simulating circuits and looking at the Nyquist plot as we build those circuits. So rather than telling me about telling me telling you how a capacitor and a resistor work when they're in series or when they're in parallel, um, I'm not going to tell you that. We'll model it. And then later on, you'll be able to download the software and do it for yourself. And then you will really, I think, really understand it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just um, slightly change pace now and open up some software. So this is the software that I'll be linking to later on. And what I'm going to do in the first instance is I'm not going to tell you that a resistor. So imagine that you had a, an electrode and it was just really high, re, um, really resistance. And you did impedance spectroscopy. This is what it would look like. So let's open up a model. So I'm going to open up. Um, this model, and I'm just going to change this to a resistor. Whoops, Daisy. Um, so, I'm, so I've opened up a simple model which has a resistor and capacitor in series, and I'm just going to edit that to be two resistors. So it's two resistors in series. They're both 1,000 ohms, so it's a 2,000 ohm resistor. 
It's not going to be terribly exciting, um, but I just want to show you what happens. We're going to simulate it by passing frequencies from 1 millihertz to 100,000 hertz. And I will simulate that. And I get a single dot. And basically, the reason it's a single dot is it has no imaginary component. It has, It is not a capacitor. It's a resistor. So it's literally, it has none of this circular nature because it doesn't have any imaginary component. It just is a resistor. It's very boring. Now, so if you're kind of, and now if I change the value here, so I'll change one of the resistors to being just one ohm. Now what happens is this. Notice this is at 2000. Now it's at 1001 effectively because it's just, you just add these two numbers together. So if you want to understand how a resistor works in impedance spectroscopy, um, don't let me tell you, just have a go at modeling it. So now what I'm gonna, now gonna do, and I'm not gonna tell you about capacitors, I'm gonna model a capacitor or simulate a capacitor. So let me edit this. So now what I've done is I made it a resistor and capacitor. And we're gonna investigate this resistor and capacitor from one millihertz to 100,000 hertz. And I basically get a line, and the line is at 1,000 ohms because that re reflects the resistor. And then the line just goes up in a vertical way. Now, what I'll do is I'm actually just going to change the frequency. What I said to you earlier on is capacitors are, um, they have a high impedance at low frequency. So let me just make that 100. So now we're only going to look at this resistor and capacitor at frequencies of 100 hertz to 100,000 hertz. And that went to 80 ohms. Let me just make this, let me just increase the frequency now so that we're only looking from 1,000 to 100,000. It became eight. So rather than me telling you about how capacitors behave, if you get this software, you can simulate it. You can put in capacitors, values. You can put in frequencies. You can you can work out for yourself how the how it how a capacitor behaves as a function of frequency. So I'll take it back to the original. Now what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to make what it was called a basic Randall cell. So I used the word Randall um, during the talk earlier on, and I'm going to make a basic one now. So what I'm going to do is just click onto the model. I'm going to add in parallel a resistor. So now I have resistor, capacitor, and resistor. So I said earlier on that that R1 represents the solution resistance. So if you've got urine, it'll represent the resistance of urine. If it's blood, it'll represent the resistance of blood. If you have sweat, it'll represent the, the resistance of sweat. The capacitor is you have coated that electrode. So you've put polymers or proteins on that surface. You've almost built a capacitor. Metal plus polymer often equals capacitor. So that's why we have a capacitor. And the resistance is how, how easy is it for electrons to transfer from the solution across the interface into the electrode? So that all these, even though I'm drawing circuits, all these mean something back to the original um, biosensor. And I've just simulated it, and we get this kind of classic Nyquist plot um, that looks like a semicircle. You can change the view, by the way, to be the Bode plots, et cetera, but I'm going to stay on the Nyquist plot. Now I'm going to do the last bit, which is um, I'm going to add the Warburg element. So in fact, I have something diffusing to my electrode, but I only see that diffusion um, when I actually do quite um, low frequencies. So what I'll do then is in series with that resistor, I'll add this Warburg element and I will simulate it. And what I get is a straight line. Now what I miss, see what I'm missing is, is actually there's some detail down here. It's just my Warburg element. I made it so big. It's swamped everything. So let me just take it down a bit. There's the semicircle, the Nyquist plot, and there's the um, 
Varberg element. And if I just take that down one more time, you kind of get this classic kind of shape. So rather than us teaching you about um, capacitors, resistors, and diffusion and the Warburg element, I would honestly say, you know, after the video, we'll share a um, in the comments in the in the comments section. We'll share a link to the software, and then you can play with the software and and, and do this live um, in real time. Now I'm going to do something called fitting. So, I mean, this is this this is simulation. So this is just a way of I think teaching yourself about um, when you add capacitors and resistors together, what will what will the actual um, data should look like? So it's a good way of teaching yourself. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up some um, previous data. Now most of the time, you actually you know you gather data, and then you have to try and figure out well what's you know what's the kind of equivalent circuit behind my data. So in this example, I've um, I've just loaded up some data. I never gathered this data, but I'm now going to try and um, fit it. So in the first instance, let's open up a, a model, and we'll just put the um, put a simple um, Randall circuit in. Because effectively, what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at one kind of Randall circuit and another Randall circuit. So if I just put one Randall circuit in and I fit, it doesn't fit very well, but you can just kind of see, yeah, there's the idea there's one Randall circuit. So in fact, what I should really do is put in two Randall circuits. So let me do that. So if I go um, models, um, library of models, um, I think, um, I'll try this one. I, I'm going to need to um, modify this a little bit. So I'm going to make that a, um, a resistor. And I want to make that a capacitor. Oops. I'll just do it again. Model, library of models. Um, might be easy to do this one. So I'll make that a capacitor. Oh, so I keep doing that. Right. Model, library of models. Right. So I'm going to edit this one, edit element, and make it a capacitor. Edit element and make it a capacitor. And then fit. And when I did that, effectively, now I've got the solution resistance. And I, ha I guessed that there were two Randall circuits. And you know, I guessed right. You know, it fitted um, quite well. Doesn't mean I'm right, by the way. Um, you can probably find other circuits that also meet the data. So just making up circuits, they always have to have a reality in your mind back to some, you know, that you really think that's it. Because you can have different circuits can fit the data sometimes. So you've got to be a little bit careful um, with this. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm almost going to finish this part one, but I am showing you that, you know, you can pl play with impedance spectroscopy um, without actually having done any experiments yet. So the last thing I'm going to do um, is just open up a piece of software quickly. So this is as if I've done the experiment. So this is the data acquisition software that we use, and I'll... Um, load up some of its data. So I grab some of the data. I'll just go into the um, Nyquist plot, and then I export it now. So I'm going to export it back into the um, So now I have um, my Nyquist plot of imaginary and real. I'll um, I'll start with the Randall circuit because um, a lot of, uh, that reflects a man, many sensors actually have a sort of Randall circuit type. Um, and it's not very um, 
it's not a very good um, fit. But what I'll do is I'll just increase these resistance values a bit. And then the, actually the, the fit um, really improves. So what I'm going to suggest is um, download the software. We'll put the links um, into the um, underneath the video when we um, when we put this when we when we load this up later on. And then you'll be able to get hold of the software, follow the video, and try it for yourself. And that will definitely be a good way of starting to familiarize yourself with impedance spectroscopy. So the, what else? What, what, so what I'm going to say now is I'm just going to go back to the the um, presentations quickly. So I just want to sort of summarize the part one of this, and, my, and the summary of part one for me is there are lots of texts and videos out there on um, impedance spectroscopy. Um, my advice is they're interesting, but actually I would I would start with it. I would, I'd almost start with what I've been doing today, which is um, simulating and fitting. And then from when you've done that and you've kind of got a, a sense of this, then start reading the more deeper text on this kind of work. Now I'm going to change gear slightly and just talk about um, conductivity, because I'm looking at the time now and it's um, 8.36 in London. So we haven't got an awful lot of time, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, but Conductivity, when you make conductivity measurements, rather than using lots of frequencies, you use a single frequency. Um, and so conductivity is a kind of simpler form of electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. So when you make a conductivity measurement of seawater, so you can figure out how much salt is in it, um, those kind of probes are often just using a um, single frequency. And what's happening is if you, if you open up a conductivity sensor and they're or probe, they're quite big, you know, they're 50 millimeter diameter and about 200 millimeters long. If you open them up, they've got two platinum electrodes, which are approximately, you know, one centimeter squared with um, something like a fraction of a centimeter gap between them. And just out of interest, they have the gap between the electrodes and the area of the electrodes gives you a ratio. And that ratio is the um, conductivity cell constant. So if you're trying to measure something with um, uh, high impedance, like um, deionized water, then you need a um, cell constant that's quite small. And if you're measure, trying to measure something that's very conductive, like concentrated acids, then you need a bigger cell constant. Um, so if you're wondering what cell constant is, then I've defined it here. It's like, and think of conductivity as impedance spectroscopy, but just at a single frequency. And the other big difference is with conductivity, we're often, I have talked about this imaginary component, and the imaginary component is linked to capacitance. When you're doing conductivity, we're often just trying to measure the resistance, not the um, capacitance. Now, at ZP, we have done quite a bit of work on conductivity, and we compared ourselves to traditional conductivity sensors. And um, the big difference is, you know, this, this is the size of our kind of conductivity sensor. It's sort of 10 millimeters by, let's say, 25 millimeters, and less than a millimeter thick. And it is, has a better linear range than actual the traditional type of conductivity sensor. And it's important because, I mean, at ZP, we're interested in biosensing. Um, when you have something this size, you can imagine it being mounted onto the skin. Whereas if you have a probe that's 15 millimeter diameter, 200 millimeters long, um, good luck trying to mount that to the skin. So we're showing you that the traditional probes are, or rather these new type of um, conductivity sensors function just as well as the traditional sensors. Um, and this is just a kind of a sort of zoom in on what these um, we often use a spiral for actually measuring conductivity, and that's just a sort of zoom in what they actually look like. In the literature, you often see people doing um, impedance measurements or conductivity measurements using something called an interdigitated electrode. 
interdigitated electrode means I've got electrode here and another electrode, and they're not touching, but they're like fingers going into one another. And um, there's a there's a sort of you know lots of people think that in order to do this kind of measurements, oh, I need an interdigitated electrode. You honestly don't need an interdigitated electrode. Um, and later on, we'll show you. It almost doesn't matter what your electrode is made of or what it looks like. It always works. Um, so there's lots of effort to make these very beautiful electrodes, and um, you don't need to. And as I say, if you, you can make conductivity sensing that we're doing, you can actually shrink it down kind of electronics that we make. So you can see that it really um, does all shrink down quite nicely. So what I'm um, skin conductivity for hydration. So this is some work that MOTS had done in the past. And um, people want to know their hydration levels to improve the home care of um, elderly people. People like the military and sportsmen want to know what their hydration level is. So if you can measure skin conductivity, then you, then you probably have the opportunity to measure their hydration. Um, and so the, the elasticity of skin is actually proportional to how much water is in it. If you ever want to know how dehydrated you are, just pinch the skin. So at the moment, I'm not too bad. Um, if I pinch that and it doesn't go back quickly, then I am dehydrated. Well, that's simple test. We can also do that test using um, impedance spectroscopy. Now, this is the work that Motz has done in the past. So he's measured um, skin surrogates, and um, he's modeled it with different equivalent circuits and found out that you know this equivalent circuit um, potentially was the best fit for his data. And, you know, he's done, you know, making up um, all sorts of different conductivities of artificial skin and then testing their um, impedance. So here he has um, what's called eight microsiemens per centimeter down to um, about 30,000 microsiemens per, se um, per centimeter. So he's looking at the Bode plot here, but you can see in the Nyquist plot, um, as he changes the conductivity um, of those solutions, the Nyquist plots um, are changing accordingly. And it's probably interesting to see that the data is not, you know, the data is good, but it's not beautiful like, you know, the way that sometimes data is, people try to present data as, you know, data is data. But then as long as there's signal in it, it's good enough. Um, now, Mots can talk elegantly or eloquently about this, but in fact, you know, the kind of work we've done, you know, if you try to measure um, the skin conductivity, if you try to do it on the um, bicep, there's not a good signal. If you try to measure it on the um, on the forearm, there's a bit of a signal. But if you try to measure it on the um, the thena, um, apparently the signal is better. So what we'll do now is a skin conductivity demo. So I'm going to mute myself. I'm going to ask Mots to unmute himself, and then hopefully this. And I'm also going to stop sharing. Hopefully it's over to you, Mots. Yeah, can you hear me? All right. So I'll see if I can start sharing my monitor. So that should be sharing now. So uh, in front of me, I have a uh, Anapot EIS. And I have that one hooked up to one of our gold sc uh, spiral electrodes. So I'll, I'll tilt down the camera a little bit so you can see what I'm doing uh, like this. And so what I'll be doing is that I'll, I'll start a measurement and I'm going to do, I'm going to check the conductivity of my skin and we'll see, look the response in the plot here. So what I've done is, uh, in this case, we're not using the Nyquist or the Bold plot that uh, Martin described to previously, and we're just doing a regular time scan at a fixed frequency. So uh, one of my preferred frequencies to do these types of tests is at uh, 100 kilohertz. And so I will just run it at that. And uh, you also have some leniency in what kind of uh, uh, amplitudes on the signal you're using. Uh, uh, usually for liquid solutions, you can use much lower uh, uh, signal amplitude. But uh, if you're if you're doing measurements on skin, usually it's good to use a little bit higher. So I'm using 50 millivolts in this case, just to prevent some noise, because uh, it's always easier to get good and clean and straight data when you're doing uh, measurements in liquid. But when you're 
moving it to other mediums, it's usually a little bit uh, more noise in the signal. So I'll start the measurement. And what I'm going to do now is uh, we can see that it's, it's close to zero in terms of conductance. So in the plot here, we're showing the conductance values and the susceptance values. So susceptance is the imaginary component, which is not we're not going to go into too much. And so I'm going to touch the electrode with my finger. And already you can see that we have a slight jump, right? So we see that we have an increase in conductance and susceptance. And uh, Martin mentioned previously that you have a cell constant. So you can use that cell constant to, um, to get the conductivity value from this conductance value. And here comes the interesting part. It's like, uh, it's, it's very hard to sweat on your fingertips on demand. So I just got a regular glass with some uh, water in it and I added some table salt to it just to increase the salinity. So I'm just gonna quickly dip my finger in it and just wipe it off a little bit. And then I'm going to touch the electrode again, and let's see if we see a higher signal. And so already you can see that the by, by adding some saline moisture to my skin, which would uh, in this case represent sweating, we, we already increased the, uh, the measurements. You can see a much higher conductance reading. And it's probably going to go down a little bit since, I am, um, since uh, it wasn't my skin that was sweat. It was the solution that was uh, making it more saline but uh, it seems to be stabilizing at a higher value. So this is just, uh, was just a quick demo on how to show how you could do skin type measurements. You can measure on a lot of different locations like uh, the palm of your hand or other location with high amounts of ecrine uh, sweat glands. Um, if you're trying to measure on uh, uh, body parts with lower uh, amount of sweat glands, you might need a contact gel or something to get a good sensor contact to your skin to be able to do a measurement. As you know, the, the electrodes are flat in this case, which is why we actually can do these measurements. Since traditional um, conductivity electrodes that Martin was mentioning, they have a parallel plate. So it's really very difficult to do a uh, surface uh, measurement. Mark, so, that's, Mark, that's, Mark that's, uh, I, I appreciate that. It's very, um, <laughs> it's a very, it's a very, very elegant lecture. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I'm going to, um, as per normal, we always go over, so we've got 30 minutes left. So what I'm going to do now is I'll switch back to the presentation, introduce the soil quickly, and then tell Niti that she'll have about 30 seconds. But So let me just, um, I'm, if Mots is muted, I'm going to reshare my screen. Um, and we're going we're gonna to th thank you for, the, for that um, elegant demo. It's quite nice, um, very nice. And... Um, so I'll share, which I'm doing. Um, and so that was a um, demonstration from MOTS on um, skin conductivity. Um, as you can see, it was quite nice because in some ways, you know, how hard was it to at least, you know, do that kind of experiment? So sometimes the hardest step is the first step. So if you're interested in impedance spectroscopy, unfortunately, you do need an impedance spectrometer, but after that, you're good to go. Now, at Zimmer Peacock, we are um, also interested in um, other matrices, including soil. So if you um, Google ZP AgTech, you're going to find that actually we're making a sensor for measuring the nitrate in soil. In order to measure the nitrate in soil, we probably think we also need to measure the moisture in soil because the amount of nitrate you see is proportional to the nitrate, and it's also proportional to how much water there is in the soil in order to solubilize that nitrate. So. That's our rationale for why we're interested in um, measuring the uh, conductivity of soil, because we're interested in measuring the moisture of soil. I said earlier on that people get too het up on, you know, what sensor configuration do they need for this kind of conductivity measurements? And the quick answer is Niti did this work, um, or at least guided it, if not did it. Yeah, guided it. But it's worth saying that, look at this. We've used gold electrodes to do conductivity. We've done spiral electrodes to do conductivity. We've used um, silver chloride electrodes to measure conductivity, and we compared it against a traditional probe. And if you watch this video later on, you're going to see that all the data is really similar. So what's the, so what's the lesson from this? Um, most, a lot of ZP's standard screen printed electrodes could be used to measure conductivity. Um, and you know we've used gold. 
um, gold planar electrodes, gold spiral electrodes, silver chloride spiral electrodes, and compare them to the Metla Toledo. We only had one Metla Toledo um, conductivity sensor. So here's the data from that one probe. So it has a certain sensitivity. Um, here's the sensitivity from the silver chloride. Here's the sensitivity from the gold. Here's the sensitivity from the gold spiral. And the sensitivity here between 18 and 26. So it's just a quick way of saying, in reality, it doesn't really matter. They all work um, and don't get too worried about it. Just have a go. So we're going to do a soil moisture demo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Niti to um, unmute herself. I will share the screen. I'll let Niti um, introduce the experiment and she can share her screen. So sound check, Niti. Hi, can you hear me? Awesome. All right. So, hi. What I'm going to be doing now is I have three samples of soil. So, I'm just going to put my screen a little more visible here. So, I have three samples of soil, and they're at different levels of salinity. They have different amounts of NaCl in there. And what I'll do is, in the interest of time, I've already introduced my AgCl uh, sensor into my first soil sample, and it is connected to an anapod EIS. So, slightly different from what Mots has done. Uh, um, in my case, I'll be doing something known as a frequency sweep. I mean, a frequency sweep, I have uh, a minimum frequency of 10 hertz and then going all the way up to 100K hertz. So, and what we will have is readings that go from 10 frequencies per decade. So when I hit play, um, I have set my graph. I'm not doing a Nyquist plot or a body plot here. So what you can see here is a plot that contains both the conductance and resistance values. Um, and you can always rescale that. So let's have a look. And there we go. So that is the conductance value. So it takes a few seconds to get this reading because after all, it is a sweep. And so it takes uh, every reading that is like 10 frequencies per decade. So once that's done, what we do next is just give it a couple of small seconds. And once that reading is attained, it'll just do a quick beep. There we go. Ooh, okay, it's doing some more readings. So while it does that, let me also explain what we're doing here. It's basically what we want to try and understand is what is the different conductivity levels of soil at different levels of salinity, and then we equate that to the moisture of soil. So once this reading is done, I'm just going to remove the sensor. So obviously there's going to be a little bit of soil there, so you just give it a quick rinse in DI water and then clean that up move it to the next sample, which has medium salinity. And it sits quite well. You don't really need to do much. Just let it sit in the soil and hit play again. So the next reading, I'm expecting it to be slightly higher because this is of a higher level of salinity. And as you can see, it is actually doing that. So while this happens here, what I'm going to do is this, I'll select this thing called select point. When I select that, I can actually take my readings of conductance from here. So if I click on that, it'll give me my conductance reading, which is 2.587 millisiemens. So all that I need to do is put that reading in there, and I have pre-calculated. Uh, what I've done is I have pre-calculated the cell constant, and using that, I can actually find out what the conductivity of my sample is. And I'll be doing the same for the next sample as well. So that's 7.22, and that's actually going quite well. So pretty much as I expected it to be, which is great. And moving on, we have our third and last sample. So just quickly going to wait for that to get done. So using this method is actually really simple and straightforward and uh, a very easy way to find out the conductivity of soil. And obviously, because of the nature of soil, there are different types of soil. There's clay soil, there's silt, there's um, sandy soil. And it's a really simple way to find out the conductivity of the different types of soil. And there we have the last reading. Perfect. So we have three readings all done, and each of them at a different level of salinity. Over to you, Martin. Yeah, thanks very much, Niti. So what I'll do now is, if you mute, I will um, yeah. share my screen again, and um, we'll do a little conclusion. 
And um, so what's going to happen is I realize that we might have sent the link out to this um, to this webinar a little late, but it's because, in fact, we had, you know, over 40 people sign up. But I realized, guys, what we're going to do is um, we're going to send out a link to the video afterwards. So it's always going to be on YouTube and memorialized. Um, and um, so I think, you know, so we'll, there'll be a link out to this video pretty soon. You guys can watch it, which is really nice because you can kind of follow the experiments that and I really think those are really well done by um, Mots and Niti. Thank you very much. Um, you can also download that software that I use for modeling, and that will be um, really cool. So let me just sort of do some conclusions. Yeah, so I think electrochemical impedance spectroscopy is a powerful tool for biosensors. And um, Nadia was just asking online, you know, where she thought it was a good idea. And I say, yeah, use it because it is a powerful tool. It's just as easy to use, in my opinion, as, as cyclovoltametry and all the rest of them. So it's one of the tools. And I would actually focus on just doing experiments and let and let your understanding of the theory just catch up later on. And um, I would also say um, everyone's talking about artificial intelligence these days, but in penis spectroscopy, if you gather a series of data where you um, you gather data in the presence of the analyte of interest, and then you gather a series of data in the absence of the analyte of interest, you'll have very different impedance spectrums. And you can use those to then train a artificial intelligence algorithm. And we've been, we've been applying artificial intelligence to um, our voltammetry data and our impedance spectroscopy data, and it's working really well. So I recommend that if you want to be innovative and novel and you're doing some academic research, unfortunately, you have to start teaching yourself Python. Um, but it's 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 time well invested. Um, it makes you innovative, it makes you modern, and um, it's these the artificial intelligence is a really good way of looking at electrochemical spectrums. So I just want to conclude by um, thanking Haseem. Um, my apologies, we might have sent the link out to this webinar a little late, but I know what we'll do is we'll um, send it out to everyone who signed up. Um, if you've got any questions, I can see the questions there. We've got three minutes left. There is the ZP developer zone. So the guys, um, they, they know who they are. You know, And every week, we have a private streaming to the ZP developer zone. It's going really well. Next week, we're going to focus on one of our members called Am Abril. Um, so join the ZP developer zone. And also, um, follow us on LinkedIn or Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Instagram, because um, all the time, we are trying to put out material onto the web that is um, informative, educational, interesting. And so if you follow us on one of these channels, then you'll kind of see that kind of information and um, you can stay up to date. So in summary, uh, yeah, so Nadia's asking, in addition, the data obtained from the EIS, um, how to process it. So I'm just going to just do one final thing. So what I'll do is I'm going to just open up that software again, and I'm going to I'm going to Nadia asked a question, so I'm just going to um, answer it. So, for example, you know, impedance spectroscopy is just one of the options. So you can you know, so this is the Anapot EIS software. You can just choose impedance spectrometry. You can I'm going to load my data because um, so I've just loaded it. So pretend I just did my experiment and now I have my data. Now I need to process my data. And how do I process it? I just click this button. I open it in the spectrum analyzer. I've now got my data. Now I need to process it. I need to know what the equivalent circuit is behind this experiment. So just go model, library of models, um, this one here. That's a guess, by the way. But notice I didn't change any of the values. I just said fit, and I got it wrong. But if I now just change these values up, and this is why you need to kind of start getting fitting and modeling so you can practice this. Bang, got it. So Nadia had a quick question there, and I just wanted to answer it very quickly. Um, I, I will conclude now by saying, do follow us on social media. Really good job, Niti and um, Mats. Very succinct, very clear, really appreciate it. And we'll do another big webinar in four weeks time. But in the meantime, we'll still be doing our um, weekly webinars to the ZP developers zone. So um, 
I'm going to um, stop the webinar, but thanks everyone and have a good day.